And today we're going to talk about the radical courage. And so the preacher Adrian Roder Rogers tells about a man who bragged that he had cut off the tail of a man-eating lion with his pocket knife. And asked why he hadn't cut off the lion's head. The man replied, somebody had already done that. You see, the man believed that he could only handle cutting off the lion's tail once the lion was actually dead. But what he really did, he just simply found the easy way out. And he made an, 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 an easy way to make himself sound greater than he actually was. You see, I think we often do not have the courage to face the real fear when it comes to sharing our faith in Christ because we base it, on, base it upon what we think we can handle, on our abilities to do things. But as you well know, we live in a culture that is increasingly antagonistic towards Christianity, or at the very least, extremely apathetic towards it. And so as a result, it takes a great deal of courage to live for Jesus radically in our culture, to share the gospel with the people that we know. But we have a tendency, like this man, to take the easy way out, going the way of the culture and trying to blend in. Or we might stay silent so as not to upset anybody. But all of these are trusting in our own strength. And so when we trust in our own strength and abilities to move past our fears and sharing the gospel, we will consistently fall short and take the easy way out. And so here's what we need to learn this morning, is that we can have radical courage as we trust in the truth of the gospel and its triumph over evil attempts to thwart it. So we're going to look this morning at four reasons why we can have radical courage because of what God has done through the gospel. So I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 4 in your Bibles. If you need a Bible, you didn't bring one, there's a brown hardcover back in the seat in front of you. Turn to page 1093 and I'm going to give a quick background while you turn there. You see, up to this point in the story, Jesus has been crucified. He died. He was buried. And then he rose again. And during the 40 days following his resurrection, he would appear over and over again to his disciples. And he taught them during this time, most likely he taught them a more full picture of what the kingdom of God was supposed to be like than what he had been teaching them over the last three years. And at the end of this time, Jesus tells them three very important things. First, he says, make disciples of all nations. Then he says, you will be my witnesses throughout the whole earth. And lastly, he says, wait for the helper, the Holy Spirit, to come before you go anywhere because that is what's going to give you the power to be able to share the gospel, to be his witnesses. And so the disciples, they followed those, those instructions. So in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes. The apostles then are enabled to perform miracles, to speak on behalf of God. And they, these miracles were given to show and prove that what they were saying about Jesus did not come from them, but came from God. So then we get this story in Acts chapter 3 that leads into our story today, where Peter and John are going up to the temple, going up to a prayer service, just going about their normal daily lives. And they come across a lame beggar who is asking for money. Now, I, it makes me sad that I have to clarify to make sure you understand that some people don't understand lame. Lame, is, in this sense, is not, this guy was not very cool. He's a lame beggar. <laughs> it's our culture. I have to clarify. Lame as in he can't walk. Okay? And so this beggar, he is begging for money. And, and, and Peter says to him, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And the crazy thing about this story is it, it, it emphasizes the point in Acts chapter 3 that this man was born this way. He had always been unable to walk. And it says in the passage literally that he jumped up. He jumped up. He was able to walk instantly. This was an instantaneous miracle, not a progressive thing. And so from the commotion of this event, people saw what was happening, and they knew this man. They, they had seen him at the temple over and over again, and now he stands up. And so from the commotion, Peter then takes advantage of this opportunity, and he shares the gospel, talking about how God gave Christ on our behalf to die the penalty, to, to, to die on the cross on our behalf, behalf, to pay the debt of our sin, that Jesus did this. And so because the people knew and recognized this lame beggar, they were now this captive audience to hear what Peter and John had to say. But specifically, Peter talks about something pretty controversial at the time, about the resurrection of the dead, or how Jesus himself had risen from the dead. 
And so now where we pick up in Acts chapter, chapter 4, we see how the, the certain religious leaders are going to respond to what Peter and John said and what Peter and John do in response to that response. So let's go ahead and read and start in verse uh, 1 of chapter 4. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. So part of the audience that gathers, it's the chief priest, the temple of the guard, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees. And I want you to keep in mind, a lot of these people, especially the chief priests, were instrumental in making sure that Jesus had been crucified. They want this new faith to be squashed immediately. But some of you might be completely unfamiliar with the term Sadducees. So let me kind of describe for you a way that my Bible, one of my Bible professors at uh, Bible college described it. So it helps you a little, rem little remember uh, memory thing. So the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So hearing Peter talk about the resurrection of the dead would be offensive to them. And in other words, that actually means they don't believe in some sort of an afterlife whatsoever. And so they, because they didn't believe in an afterlife, they were sad, you see. <laughs> Extremely lame joke, but it helps. Okay? I have never forgotten it to this day. <laughs> Okay? But this particular group, they were annoyed because Peter and John were proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. And they're going, no, 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 that's not true. And we don't want this talked about. So they have Peter and John arrested, even though they did absolutely nothing illegal. And having them arrested was a way to basically kind of give them a warning. Like, hey, you've crossed a line. Don't cross it again. We're going to put you in jail so you can think about it. Putting them in kind of a timeout. But here's, the, but it didn't do anything. <laughs> You see, this persecution that happened didn't squash the, the church's growth. It actually triggered it. Look, it says that 5,000 men came to faith. That doesn't even include the women and the children. That doesn't include the slaves in the household, the servants that were living in some of these people's households. And so there's an astronomical, there's a lot of people coming to Christ at this time in, in a lot of ways. And so even though Peter and John had been put in prison and seemingly were stopped, the gospel continued to succeed. And here's our first reason we can have courage is that the gospel succeeds even when evil attempts to stop it. You see, the second church, second century church father, Tertullian, once said that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So in other words, when the church is persecuted, seeds of growth are planted for the church. You see, the church can have a tendency to grow when it is heavily persecuted. And there are incredible examples of this. I read this in an article this week uh, about, uh, from this website called Sat7. They're based in the UK. Here's some examples they gave of how the church grows even when evil tries to stop them. The massive growth of Christians in China when communism kicked out missionaries grew, this church grew exponentially over a period of 50 years despite heavy persecution from their government. And so as well, since the 1979 revolution, Christians in Iran have also found themselves pressured, coerced, imprisoned, threatened with death, or executed. And yet, Iran has the largest number of believers to have embraced the Christian faith from across the Islamic world world. You see, the gospel succeeds even when evil attempts to stop it. But you see, the, this kind of growth isn't always the case. We have to keep this in mind. You see, there are many countries around the world where those who are attempting to stop Christianity are actually winning the day. The same article that I read on Sat7, this is what they also referenced. While in the 1800s, Japan was home to hundreds of thousands of Christians, most were killed and forced to reconvert or hide their faith when the emperor banned Christian faith. It was only after World War II that some of Japan's secret Christians emerged and a small number of churches were opened. To this day, the number of believers in Japan is a fraction of what it was before. And so also in the first decade of the 21st century, Todd Johnson, an evangelical scholar who works on the World Christian Encyclopedia and the World Christian Database, estimates that one million Christians died for their faith, an average of 100,000 per year. 
So we have to have a full picture that yes, even though there are moments where the church explodes in growth despite the fact that there is heavy persecution, there's also times where evil seems to win the day. But here's what we can have hope in. Even when evil seems to have its victories, the gospel cannot and will not ultimately be overcome. See, Jesus said in Matthew 16, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and here's the key phrase, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. See, this is the same moment when Peter proclaims that he, he sees Jesus as you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and so Jesus is saying, I'm building this, my church upon that confession, upon Jesus being the son of the living God. And he says, there's nothing that's going to stop that church. There is nothing. So we can have courage that even if we lose individual battles, even if we give in to our anxiety, even if we give in to our fear, that God ultimately is winning the war for the souls of people around the world. So even if evil has its day, they win the battle at one point. We can have faith that God's church cannot be ultimately defeated or eliminated, but will continue to spread the message of hope throughout the world. This is our reason, that the gospel succeeds even when evil attempts to stop it. We can have an incredible courage because of this truth, that no matter what happens in this world, God will continue to move and continue to overthrow earthly kingdoms, and he will overcome Let's continue verse 5. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So the rulers, elders, and scribes, they all come together to meet and discuss what they are going to do with Peter and John. And remember, the, again, these are all these leaders that were responsible for having Jesus be crucified. But if they thought that they had getting rid, gotten rid of their little Jesus problem, they were soon to realize that they were not going to get rid of it anytime soon. So they begin this trial, and they ask them this question. By what power or name did you do this? By what authority are you acting in this way? By what authority are you saying these things? They're checking their sources. They want to find out where this is coming from. But then we see in this same moment that Peter and John see a fulfillment of something Jesus had promised to them. See, in Matthew 10, he told them to not fear when they have moments where they stand in front of rulers and kings. He says, you're going to stand in front of rulers and kings, and I'm going to give you the words to speak. So then it says that Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. He is given the words to speak. And so what, this is what he basically tells them. He says, if they're being questioned regarding this good deed that they did, he says this good deed actually was done through the name of the same Jesus who you crucified. And that this man now walks through Jesus. So he's basically saying we didn't do this. It was God's power working through us that this happened. God's ability to, to use his spirit to, to perform these miracles. This was him. This was not us. And that this same Jesus, he is now risen from the dead. And you know what's kind of interesting is that these, this judging court did not even dispute this fact. They didn't even try and fight and argue against that Jesus had risen from the dead. They were also confused about what happened with the empty tomb. They didn't know. They didn't know how to explain the appearances with all these people. But that's just a sidebar. Peter makes this great point in verse 11, though. He quotes a, a psalm. And he says, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. And he's, when he calls them the builders, he's calling the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, these builders. And he's saying, you then rejected the cornerstone. If you know about ancient construction, they would have this cornerstone that would set the edge, kind of be the foundational stone that they would build the rest of the building upon. 
And so what was important here is Peter's quoting this verse in the Psalms that is one of the oldest references to the Messiah, this Jewish savior figure that they believed would save them politically and rebuild the Israelite kingdom here on earth. But instead, Jesus claimed that he was this Messiah and died a shameful death on a cross in order to rescue people from their sin. And so Peter is actually being really bold here because he's basically telling them it's their fault that Jesus was crucified and they're doing. They were the ones that did it. We always have to recognize, though, it's always our sin that put Jesus on that cross, that we deserved to be there, but Jesus took the place for us. But now he's also saying that this same Jesus rose from the dead and he is sitting now at the right hand of God enthroned. And for these people, the scribes, the elders, the chief priests, they would be hearing this and they'd go, no, 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 a man sitting at the right hand of God? You're basically saying he's God himself. That's, that would be offensive to them. But Peter makes an incredible final point here. He says, there is no other name which people can be saved except through Jesus. You see, in that day and age, a name represented not only authority, but what a person was about, what they were like, their character. And so only through the person and work of Jesus is how a person can be saved. It's only through that. There is no other way. You see, you know this. We live in a culture nowadays. It's prevalent that people will believe that there are many ways to God. But as I, I discussed this at the beginning of this series, that simply isn't true. There is no other way a person can be saved from their sins. You see, Jesus even said this in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so don't miss this. The religious leaders at this time had this belief that they could, by their own rules, be right with God. And so they, this is the way that they think they can be saved. But then Peter, in this phrase, he uses a, a general term for save, which means actually saving health. It covered both physical and spiritual healing. You see, because here's why Jesus would perform the healing miracles. It was to show that this is what I want to do with the human heart. I want to radically change people's hearts so that they will obey and follow him. And so Jesus came to heal people of their sin disease. And so these physical healings showed that. But most of all, here is our second reason that we can have radical courage, is that the gospel proclaims the only way to be saved. You see, this truth is one of the many reasons our culture rejects Christianity. It's because we claim exclusivity. We, this is the only way to be saved. So how can we be so assured that this is the only way? Personally, for me, this faith is totally unique to the rest of the world's beliefs or philosophical systems which say that you can reach the pinnacle on your effort and your ability. But Christianity basically says that you cannot do this on your own because your sin has not only separated you from a perfect and holy God, but was a direct affront to him. And he must justly deal with the evil in this world, including in each and every one of us, myself included. And so he provided Christ to pay the debt for our sins. And that when Christ was on the cross, all of our sins were placed upon him. So that when we put our faith in him, his righteousness is then placed upon us. It's the beautiful truth of the gospel. And so if you don't have confidence that Christianity is the only way, I encourage you, do some research for yourself. Study the Bible for yourself and discover the truth of it. And don't just trust what I say. Don't just trust what Pastor Ron says or what Pastor Micah might say or anybody else that you might listen to on the radio that might talk about Jesus. Go and look it up for yourself. Do the research yourself. But I think this is also why it is essential that we tell people about Jesus and move past our fears. It's because billions of people around this world are believing in so many false religions, putting their trust in, ph in philosophies and scientific reasoning as their ultimate hope and reason for their existence. So are you thankful that Christ saved you from your sin? Are you grateful for his incredible love for you? Then let that motivate you to have courage to share about the blessed hope that you found in him only, not in anything that the world could provide. Let's continue, verse 13. 
When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone in, in Jerusalem, everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. So what's crazy about the first couple of verses here is that this court sees that Peter and John were uneducated and ordinary men. It had them noticing that they had been with Jesus because the same things were said about Jesus that are now being said about them. That people were astonished about the depth of knowledge and insight that they had, even though they seemed to be uneducated. But it was because of, for Jesus, it was because of his, that his knowledge came from a greater teacher than these religious leaders. And so Peter and John and the other apostles have the same mark of Jesus in this way. But I want this to be what marks each and every single one of us. Not necessarily that we're the smartest person in the room, but having people recognize that we have been with Jesus. So can people say the same thing about you? Can those who don't know Christ in your life, can they look at you and see that there's something different about you? Can they tell that your life has been changed? Can they see that Jesus has totally changed you from who you used to be and that you've been with him? Can they see that? I know for me, if someone said that to me that they couldn't tell the difference, my heart would be broken. We need to have people recognize that there is a difference. But as well, Peter and John were performing similar miracles that Jesus had performed. And this also showed, again, this was another way how they had been with Jesus. And so look at this. I love this. The judges had no position to deny their claim that they did this miracle in the name of Jesus because the beggar was right there standing with them. They knew who he was. And I love what it says at the end of verse 14. There was nothing they could say. It silenced them. They could say nothing. So now this council, the Sanhedrin, which was this ruling council of Israel, composed of 70 men, they were stuck between a rock and a hard place. They couldn't deny that a miracle had taken place, but they wanted the message to stop spreading. Peter and John hadn't broken a law by healing this beggar, but as a result of healing him, they were kind of now heroes. And it would be a bad political move to punish them for doing something that was good. But it would also not be a good move to let them keep on teaching because then they would lose their power and their influence because they had been the ones who were teaching Israel about how they ought to live. And this is a totally different way. And so they would lose that power and influence. And so they thought they had solved the problem by crucifying Jesus. But their decision here was a confession of their weakness that really all they did is they released them and all they did was just say words. They threatened them. Don't do this or we'll punish you. Don't do it. And so then we look at verse 18. They bring Peter and John back in to let them know of their decision. It's to tell them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And so I love what Peter and John's reply is. Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? They're asking this rhetorical question basically to say, wait a minute, is it our job to listen to men or is it our job to listen to God? He says, you be the judges how you decide that for yourself. But then they say, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They're basically saying, we're going to obey God rather than men. And that they have to keep on speaking about Jesus. Their priority is to obey God rather than people. And so now, this doesn't mean that if you get into a situation with a boss at work and they tell you to do something and, you know, it's perfectly normal within your work and, they, and you say, well, no, I've got this other thing I need to do uh, because God told me to, so I'm going to obey God rather than you. Or if you, you know, if you're a kid and you have your, your parents come to you and say, hey, clean your room. And you're like, nope, I'm not going to do it because God told me to do something else, so I'm going to obey God rather than men. That's not what this means. 
What this means is that when it comes to situations when we are asked to disobey God, we will obey God rather than men. And so Peter and John cannot stop speaking about Jesus because they saw and heard stuff with, with Jesus. They weren't just people who heard about Jesus from other sources. They saw him themselves. They heard him themselves. So they had to keep speaking about it. And so all the Sanhedrin could do was just to threaten them. Because look, it says because all the people were praising God for what had happened. So they couldn't, again, they were stuck. They were powerless. The people were praising God. And because this man had been healed, he was 40 years old. So he'd been, he had been this way for a long time. And so the reality was that these leaders had to be afraid of what was happening. They knew that this Christianity thing was not simply just going to disappear and go away. They knew that their threats were weak and they probably felt powerless. And so Jesus' words were coming true as we talked about earlier, that evil would never be able to overcome the church. So here's our third reason we can have courage, is that the gospel turns worldly kingdoms upside down. Notice how the Sanhedrin is essentially silenced. They had nothing that they could say. They're put into a corner and they can't get out of it. They recognized the power of the miracle that had happened. It was a legitimate one, but they politically felt like they couldn't do anything except to tell them just to stop talking about Jesus. Their hands were completely tied and so all they can do is just threaten them. And so what this shows is how Human beings are really good at creating their own little kingdoms. And it could be some sort of an earthly kingdom, like a government, or it could be a kingdom of self within our own hearts that we build and we think it's never going to fall. It's always going to stand. But here's the reality is God defeats those kingdoms. He defeats those. He takes them down. He removes them. It says in the Bible that he removes kings. He sets up kings. He takes them down. He sets them up. Because God is the one who is ultimately in control. So I want to ask you this question. When you think about these worldly kingdoms that sometimes claim that they had all the power, where's Babylon today? Where's Assyria? Where's Rome? Where's the Persian Empire? You, I could go on and on and on about all these different kingdoms that have been around saying they would last forever and they didn't. But you see, each one of these empires or kingdoms have, have fallen. They have ended, but Christ's kingdom has not fallen. It's been 2,000 years. But it's because it doesn't claim any political power, but the power to change the human heart. And this is what we actually call the upside-down kingdom, because what people ultimately live for is not what God's kingdom is about. You see, God's kingdom is focused on righteousness, grace, mercy, love, peace, hope, forgiveness. While earthly kingdoms are more focused on power, on influence. Sometimes they're on forceful coercion of making people do things that they want. But humans tend to be focused on the accumulation of possessions, money, climbing the corporate ladder. But instead, Christ wants us to be focused on loving others as he has loved them. By showing grace and mercy to those who don't deserve it. By caring for those in need and living righteous lives before him. This is how we turn worldly kingdoms upside down. Is by having our own hearts turned upside down and we live for him. Let's continue the last section, verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. So with these, thre these threats laid out, Peter and John return to the church, and what's the first thing that they do? They pray. 
they pray. And not just any ordinary prayer, but a prayer that recognizes that God is the one who is sovereign. God is the one who has absolute control. Look how they start it. Sovereign Lord. That word sovereign just means God's exercise of rule over what he has made. And they say, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They're saying, God, you designed all of this. You put this all together. You know what's the truth. You are seeing what's happening to us right now. And then he says, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David, King David. And he wrote this in Psalm chapter 2. And it's basically saying, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Why are they trying to plot against God? He says, the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. The rulers and the people of the earth try and fight against what God's going to do. But check out how Peter uses this phrase. It's beautiful. It's incredible. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. And so there was a plot. They had come together to try and conspire against Jesus. They're plotting against God's holy anointed one. And, and Peter, they're saying, why are they doing this? Because look at what happens in verse 28. Look at what they said. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So all of that conspiring, all of that scheming that they were trying to do to stop God's kingdom, God already planned for that to happen beforehand. You've got to understand, Jesus dying on the cross was not God's plan B. It was God's plan A from the beginning. It was his first overall plan. So even human governments scheming to try and stop what God is doing was already planned by God. That is the ultimate trump card. I don't know about you. And so what they start to pray for, I love what they pray for. Now with that mind that God is sovereign, that God is in control, that God exercises his rule over creation, then he says, now Lord, consider their threats, what they're threatening to us. And then he says, enable your, word, your servants to speak your word with great boldness. It's amazing to me that they actually pray for more boldness and for more courage. Because you know what that means? They were probably feeling afraid. I think this tells us that it's perfectly normal to be afraid, to be nervous, to be anxious, to almost even have a panic attack about thinking about telling people about Jesus. This is normal. And that they prayed for it. But we do it anyway because not only has God called us to do this, to share the gospel, but because he will give us the ability to do it. Because look at, look at the end of verse 31. It says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. God answered their prayer so that they would speak more boldly. But then it says, and they, and they also prayed for more miracles to happen. Because they know that these miracles prove the truth of what they are speaking about. So let me just encourage you, the miracle you can use to speak about today in our culture, talk about your story of how Jesus has radically changed you. Our culture so heavily values personal stories. They might say like my truth. So tell your story how Jesus has changed you, how it was only through Jesus that you could be the person that you are today. And so to show that God had heard their prayer, I love it, God has the room shake. He's basically saying to them, I heard you. I'm answering that prayer. I'm with you. I've got you. And so for us as followers of Christ nowadays, we have the word of God sitting right in front of us. These are testimonies to how God has already worked and how God has said it numerous times. I am with you. Be strong and courageous to go and do this thing. And so we can pray the same prayer for boldness and, and we can then trust that God will answer that prayer. So here's our fourth reason we can have courage is that the gospel gives us boldness and courage. So how does the gospel give us boldness and courage? It does so because the gospel in and of itself forces us to admit that we are incapable of saving ourselves or being anything that we were created to be apart from the power of God working in us. It is only by his grace we are saved. It is only by his grace that we have the courage to share the gospel. So what we need to do then is to admit that we are not capable in and of our own power and strength to have the boldness and courage to live radically for Jesus. We desperately need him to change us, to use us, to conform us to the image of Jesus through the transformation his Holy Spirit brings into our hearts. So have you ever struggled with being shy and feeling weak and sharing the gospel with those you know? Then this is a sign that, that you're trusting in your own strength. 
And this might be the pot calling the kettle black because this is something that I struggle with deeply about having anxiety and fear and shyness to share the gospel. But, because, but the truth is, we are weak in and of ourselves to share the gospel. We need Jesus to do it through, the, through us. We can't do it on our own power and strength. And you know what? This is actually a good thing. Check out what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, this is the famous passage where Paul talks about the thorn in the flesh that he had going on. He prayed for God to remove it from him. And God kept saying, no, God didn't take it away. And this is how God responds. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So because God's power is made perfect in weakness, Paul says this crazy thing. I'm going to boast about my weaknesses because when I am weak, then I am strong. So you know what? It's okay to admit that you are powerless because then Christ can be powerful in you. It's okay to recognize that you are weak because then Christ can be strong in you. And because God's grace is enough to be the power in your weakness of having anxiety, of having nervousness, of having fear, let God's grace be enough to be the power in your weakness. Let him be the thing that works in you. See, there's another story told by the, the famous preacher Chuck Swindoll of a test conducted by a university where 10 students were placed in a room. And a big card was put in front of them. Three lines of varying length were drawn in front of them. You'll see a little small diagram of it on the screen. You see, the students were told to raise their hand when the instructor pointed to the longest line. As you can clearly see, it's number one. I made it very obvious. Number one's the longest one. But nine of the students had been instructed beforehand to raise their hand when the instructor pointed to the second longest line. So nine out of the ten students in the room would raise their hand when number three was pointed to. And so the usual reaction of uh, the stooge, the, there was one person in the room who what they called the stooge who had no idea what was going on. The one person who could see it. And you know what the, their usual reaction was when they saw everybody not raising their hands at the right answer? They put their hands up, look around, 75% of the time. And these were students, grade school all the way up through high school. And it showed, the researchers concluded that many people would rather get along with everybody, go with the flow, than be right. So here's the reality. We will often have to be the stooge and be willing to stand up knowing what is the truth, even when everyone else might give a different answer because we need to have confidence that this really is the truth. And we know that we have God's Holy Spirit dwelling in us to give us the courage that we need to share his gospel, trusting that he will give us the words to speak when we don't have them. So I wanna end this morning by looking at a quote from uh, David Platt who inspired a lot of what I've been talking about the last few weeks, we'll have it on the screen. Radical obedience to Christ is not easy. It's not comfort, it's not health, not wealth, and not prosperity in this world. Radical obedience to Christ risks losing all these things, but in the end, such risk finds its reward in Christ, and he is more than enough for us. So do we have the courage to view the risk as worth the infinite reward of Jesus? Do we have the courage to do that? But we have to remember, we can have radical, radical courage as we trust in the truth of the gospel and its triumph over evil's best attempts to thwart it. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning and we thank you that you are such a good God who loves us, who cares for us, who has given his life for us. God, we just pray that we would be enabled by your spirit to have the strength and the courage that we need to share this amazing truth of the gospel. God, we love you that we can come to you and boldly proclaim and ask for you to give us that boldness and courage and you will do that for us. So help us to depend on your strength, not on our own. And so God, we give this morning to you in Jesus' name, amen.